some infrastructure type things that you have to get over first. Um, and <coughs> fundamentally, in any mission, um, you're going to have base costs of your um, hydrogen or helium. You know, I'll talk to you about hydrogen later. Um, yeah. And okay. uh, <laughs> much cheaper after uh, alternative. And um, and we have one of our former Far Horizonites uh, experimenting with it now. And um, I can show you his documentation on that. Well, I mean, his some of his details on that. And I should I should get you in contact with him too. He's pushing the envelope these days with doing different uh, methods of house to blending. Um, and then you're going to have transportation costs, you know, which is minimal in a sense. But then also, um, so this is like after you set up. Mm -hmm. So multiple flights up there. So fundamentally, um, a lift gas costs uh, transportation and um, balloon. Um, so other than that, everything else is reusable. As long as you get it back. <laughs> <laughs> but we've been pretty good at doing that. Um, so I'm trying to think what's the best way to start. Answering your question, getting you guys off the ground, or getting the Q Lab off the ground. <coughs> yeah, so we've got, uh, I've got an agenda, so let me, um, okay. I'm just posting. I'm Jay did not have internet at the hotel last night, what? so he's catching up. So I'm playing oh. catch up on all the things I wasn't able to do last night. Mm -hmm. All right, you so. Poor thing. Yeah, what it is do? kind of frustrating, um, especially since I had a hangout last night. Thankfully, you can get called in on your phone, and so Jeremy was my eyes and ears and hands, and I just was sitting there with my earbuds on my iPhone, running a, <laughs> half running a meeting and relying on Jeremy yeah. to do the other half of running the meeting last He's, night. It was interesting. Um, so anyway, for this, for today, mm -hmm. um, we will go ahead and get started. And so what I've got is we've scheduled a series of meetings, and these meetings basically follow... Um, a lightweight engineering process, mm -hmm. engineering design process that was presented at last year's Open Hardware Summit as mm -hmm. kind of a, when hackers need to design something, they don't have to go to the full systems engineering process that they teach in a master's mm -hmm. course, master's degree yeah. of systems engineering, but you need a plan. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there are certain things you need to ask yourself ahead of time before you do a thing, and obviously you guys are already doing it, mm -hmm. but we thought it'd be a nice way to make sure that we didn't miss any essential documentation to walk through the process in high speed, where instead of having to develop things, what we're really doing is capturing the answers to these to these pieces of documentation that probably already exist, because you guys have been doing this for a while. Well, you know, the funny thing is, this has sort of been a, um, um, <coughs> by the seat of our pants, kind of a, um, um, what do you say, uh, kind of, happened, as, developed as it happened for like six years. We got to the point we are with very little documentation. And that's the, one of the advantages of having you guys go, all right, <laughs> you, you know, now we need to explain it succinctly. So, yeah. Yeah. you know, because we never, <laughs> right. but, but we're just starting to do that actually, which is good because we need yeah. a, a better plan as well. Great. Well, I think then this will be a, a nice give and take opportunity because we can walk through the process. Mm -hmm. Um, and we're and we can also at the end of the weekend share with you the links to where her presentation is mm -hmm. uh, on her process and the slides so that you can actually oh uh, for the documentation process for her process yeah. for a design process. Okay. Um, but then you'll have also had gotten your hands dirty a little bit with this kind of high tempo version of it of mm -hmm. the first half of it, which okay. is ca which is the design. Obviously, the back half is go build it and yeah. do testing and operate and then you iterate mm -hmm. until you're satisfied. Okay. Um, so um, before we get really going though, because mm -hmm. I, I, this is the first time some of us have met in person, yeah, I, was, I wanted to real quick just go around the room and there's all three of us who will be fast, <laughs> yeah. um, but Ken, you, are, you, know, you and I have already met mm -hmm. a couple times, um, but this is uh, Jeremy Wright. Mm -hmm who is a Mach 30 volunteer who's been working with us since February, I think. I think so, yeah. Uh, and yeah. had Ohio as well, or? Indiana. Indiana. Yeah, actually not too far from where you recovered your last balloon. Jay said it was over the December flight. Uh, the, oh, okay. Over near uh, Peru, Indiana, oh, okay. in that area. Yeah. I live very close. Okay. Yeah, we've landed in your backyard a few times, I bet. <laughs> um, okay, and what's your background? What's your experience? Um, I have a uh, background in mechanical engineering. Oh, can I? Uh, uh, so yeah. like, did you notice this? I uh, hope you don't get too um, 
Okay. We I didn't notice it, but the bus, like, the road is right above us, uh, so there's gotcha. a little pothole. Yeah, okay. so don't be uh, everybody yeah. easily alarmed by that. Okay. <laughs> so, sorry. Um, yeah, I've got a bachelor's in mechanical engineering, mm -hmm. and um, I have my own company that does software development and um, open source software consulting. Oh. Okay. So, that's and uh, and primarily up until this point, Jeremy's been helping us out with a little test stand for ST's motors mm -hmm. um, as an opportunity Ooh, to um, get practice with open source hardware mm -hmm. in a distributed fashion. We got Jeremy, myself, and some folks from QLab, including Greg Moran, mm -hmm. uh, all working in like two or three different time zones <laughs> uh, yeah. spread out across two thirds of the country. Mm -hmm. And so it's been a good opportunity to test out open design engine and our processes, but it okay. also is a chance to, um, to build something that uh, we have engineering merit around uh, where we can get practice developing something that has some complexity mm -hmm. and operating test stands because eventually we mm -hmm. want to build up to test stands that are much more significant in scale. We want to be able to build test stands that can test hybrid rocket motors okay. uh, and eventually liquid yeah. rocket engines. Yeah. Uh, and so we start with something safe that even if we screw up, we're unlikely to hurt anybody yeah. on and work yeah. out. The current mm -hmm. test stand is a level one kite. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. So, so it's another... We say kites, it's uh, the Wright brothers did their yeah. initial development with kites. Mm -hmm. uh, and all told, they put in the equivalent of like twenty or $30,000 of current money mm -hmm. to develop the first airplane. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of, and, yeah. and a lot of that was they did a lot of small scale testing first. That's really funny, because um, I was just reading about them. Um, and a really interesting thing popped up, which I have to ask about tomorrow, is, um, you know, current aviation is the, the uh, airstrip that we yeah, launched from. Yeah. And I think I had mentioned to you that his father or grandfather must have been that started the airstrip. Um, actually has his pilot's license um, approved Issued by, by one of the Wright brothers. Oh, yeah. nice. And then when I was looking at the uh, just some um, biography stuff about the Wright brothers, uh, one of the things popped up that was odd is that his um, the Wright brothers um, mother's maiden name was Kerner. Hmm. And I was like, hmm, I had to ask them if oh, they were wow. related. Yeah. Hmm. Anyway. So, just a small <laughs> Yeah. Anyway, so it's kind of a background from like where Jeremy's been helping us at Mach 30 too. Mm -hmm. I want to make sure that that was in there. Um, yeah. And uh, Jeremy's definitely been one of the uh, one of the guinea pigs for Open Design Engine. <laughs> so. Yeah. Yeah. It's been a good experience yeah. overall. So. Okay. All right. Um, and then in terms of it, in terms of process. Um, Let's see, so that's that way, Jeremy and I know each other, you and I know each other, uh, and Jeremy, you got some of Ken's background at the Aries 9. Yeah, so that was, I was one of the YouTube viewers. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that that maybe more or less constitutes introductions this time. Okay. If we have more people, we'll do more. I'll move that, by the way. Probably. People will be going for the copy. There, you can put it up there over there. Thank you. There's nothing to hold people back here. <laughs> All right. All right. So I promise it's not a body in the bag. It's a yeah. flip chart. Okay. Um, so then, in terms of like process, mm -hmm. uh, there are two major things I want to go over real quick. Um, the first is um, my plan is to facilitate these meetings. I have a background in professional meeting facilitation mm -hmm. for consensus uh, decision making, uh, and so I intend to use the tools of that craft throughout the weekend to when we're doing these gathering requirements and things like that. Okay. Um, the the couple of things that I always point out when I'm doing that, when I call ground rules, are you know if something happens and you need to excuse yourself, that's fine. In the case of a meeting this small, we'll simply take a short break mm -hmm. um, uh, because I'd much rather if something needs to be taken care of, it's not distracting you from doing the work in the meeting. Um, we're right, all pulling team. on the same process. Yes, I'm be a little distracted today. I'll try yeah, to be <laughs> yeah. I, I get that. We're the day before a launch, so. Yeah. Um, but if something comes up where it really needs your attention, I'd yeah. rather you just say right away, hey, Jay, we need five minutes because somebody needs me to answer a question than, um, okay. than to have that become a thing where 15 minutes later we realize we have to rewind the meeting 15 minutes to get caught back up. Mm -hmm. I'd much rather take the five minutes when it happens. Um, so just whatever you need to take care of, that's fine. And I'll warn you right now, we might make a couple moves, um, physical space right. moves. Um, depending, I waiting to see if my office mate's coming in. If not, uh, that might be the best place to do some of this. Um, we have 
more whiteboards and other things in there. And um, also, I'll just spend some time in the lab soon. So right, um, right. Um, the the other thing um, uh, that I really want to point out is, as the facilitator, uh, I'm gonna whenever there's a doubt about the process about how to move a conversation forward, I'm gonna decide, but not about content. When it comes down to a decision about what something should say mm -hmm. in terms of accurately capturing the documentation, that's not where I'm gonna invoke that rule. Mm -hmm. But if we're suddenly spinning out of control where we're not making <laughs> progress, I'm gonna simply say, let's try doing this. Um, to keep us on schedule. Okay. Um, so there you go. And then the other major piece of review that I wanted to do in terms of overview was the general process. Like I said, we're going to do this high-speed version of the first half of the design process for Amanda <coughs> Wozniak. And um, did you say that the there's a link on the Mach 30? Uh, there's a there are links from uh, about, the that process? There, about their process. Yeah, uh, yeah. I can give you those links absolutely. Okay. Okay. Um, Sorry, I didn't look over this one. That's all right. In fact. Um, the, this link in the actual in the in the Google Docs document, there's a link ah. to the lightweight systems engineering. Okay, that's what process. we're following. Then. That's what okay. we're following. Okay. Um, and so the pieces that we're really going to focus on today, mm -hmm. leading through Sunday, are uh, asking an initial set of questions. They're basically framing questions before you develop the technical requirements. Mm -hmm. Developing the technical requirements, although that is mostly a question of wordsmithing, once you have the initial questions developed. And so the plan is that we will work on that this evening. Okay. Uh, so we will not do step two in the process, the requirements, actual generation in the meetings today, but we will bring those back for Sunday for review. Mm -hmm. um, the next is to do, uh, to develop a block diagram. So very high level design documentation. Um, for example, if we were looking at the balloon itself, which is really just a piece of your overall system, right? Mm -hmm. The block diagram might have something like the balloon, mm -hmm. like the flight system, we call it the flight vehicle, the balloon, mm -hmm. the parachute, the cut the, the cut system, mm -hmm. right? The payload, the tracking system. Mm -hmm. That might be a, a representative block diagram. Okay. And what that gives us is um, it, it guides the rest of the discussion because then what we have to do is we have to fill in the design details for everything that shows up in the block diagram. And then we'll do design yeah, details. We'll actually go in and talk about the design and the decisions around and for things yeah. like the balloon. Okay. I, I imagine we're just going to yeah. yeah. we're going to say there are here are here the are the the, are the, the model the part yeah. numbers and the vendors mm -hmm. that you can get that it's a bill of materials item okay. uh, with some flexibility in terms of the weight or something like that yeah. Yeah. Uh, versus like the little cutter. Uh, mm -hmm. I imagine there's some. Some detail to that. It's, yeah, it's a little black box when, from what I've seen, but yeah. there's magic happening. Yeah. There's engineering yeah. happening in there, yeah. and we need to design that. But we need to document that because they're going to need one. And then on Sunday, all of this comes to a head at the design review, which is ordinarily in the process that would be the place where you check out: Are we willing to? Are we satisfied the design is is good enough to press forward with a build? In this case, it's: Are we satisfied that, the, that we have captured the design? accurately enough to move yeah. forward and build. It's a subtle variation on that because right. of, um, yeah. because we're doing things yeah. a little we're backwards. Okay. So, kind of so that's kind of where we're, we're headed and then that leads us to start with the questions. This used to be one person, now we're like four people in there. Yeah. I sent you an email, Kim, with a link to the Far Horizons Thank project on our DE and also Amanda yeah. Wozniak's. That's what's kind of trying to dig around. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. So, okay. Yeah, that's basically all we need to do. Oh, I have my capture this a little bit. Yeah. That's where we're headed. So the first place we're going to go is looking at the initial questions. And um, what I thought we would do is just ask each of these questions um, out loud and then go around the room and 
put our answer, our proposed answer to the question out in the room. And then if there's any massaging to do to kind of come to a lightweight consensus, it's not going to be formal. It's going to be where none of us are verbally objecting in the meeting. We'll capture that as the final answer that we'll document in the, in the material. And the fuzzy place for us will be um, that some of these questions we may want to split the answers into the answer as it applies to the balloons you are currently flying versus uh, someone that's going to just start off getting into high altitude balloons mm -hmm. and yeah, yeah, like yeah. QLab is. So there will be a little yeah. bit of fuzziness there. Uh, did I forward you the email I sent to um, I'm sorry, who was you, it? Greg. Greg. Greg yeah. Yes, you did. I did? Okay. Yeah. So that was, you know, like the briefest of overviews. Absolutely. For him and some, Absolutely. Some like, so. and, and today we'll just, through this process, I promise, we will get into the gory details. Okay. No, I just want to, you know, uh, yeah, what absolutely. I'll probably be doing a lot of times is just sending you a bunch of links to things that are perfect the references. And, absolutely. Um, in addition to all the hardware stuff. Yep. All right. So uh, the first question is, why are we making this? So when Adler first got started, what what a, what thing does flying these high altitude balloons accomplish? Um, it's, uh, well, the big picture goal for uh, Geza and Mark, who are uh, yeah. the astronomers who started this program, where they really were itching to do uh, CubeSats, CubeSat missions. And um, with no near space or orbital uh, design experience whatsoever, um, said, well, it's kind of a leap to go from, <laughs> from zero nothing to, to CubeSats. Yeah, exactly. So <laughs> I said, hey, how about high altitude ballooning? Um, so they were helped six years ago, I think it was now, um, by Paul Verhaeg, um, who is kind of literally wrote the book. I will send you the book. <laughs> oh, <laughs> nice. literally wrote the book on this. Um, and he came out to help uh, pretty much seed the program. And so the motivation was to, in a sense, have a um, um, a technical driver to uh, design, uh, get up to the CubeSat area at some point. Um, also, uh, as we're you know a nonprofit and education facility as well, it's like wow, this is a great opportunity for low cost to uh, do educational programs for near space. Experimentation, uh, design, and engineering challenges, and that's one of the things we do a lot of with Far Horizons. Everything from middle school age kids all the way up to we have undergrad interns and then adult volunteers of experience. So, all right. So, cool. And do you get all ages? to participate in the balloon launches? Or yeah, we try to make it as hands-on as possible. Jeremy, do you have anything from uh, from where you're seeing things from Mach 30 and QLab that you would add to that? Because um, that actually seems very fitting. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah I think uh, it seems like a lot of groups are trying to use balloons as a stepping stone to CubeSat, mm -hmm. so I think you guys yeah. are, are right yeah. along the line with that. You know, you can consider our program um, other than being in an actual institution, pretty much a, a maker group uh, because we're driven by volunteers, we're driven by um, people donating a lot of time and energy into this, um, their own volition and just trying to make things happen. So it's very similar in, in uh, mode. Yeah. All right. Um, so what I've got is that the, the big picture is uh, built up to developing CubeSats um, and uh, with the added benefit of providing educational opportunities to practice near space mission with near space missions with um, students and enthusiasts. Mm -hmm. And to inspire a community too. Uh, that's one of also our motivations that if you look at the um, on the Far Horizons project blog, uh, we have a statement about taking back space exploration. Um, and I kind of, Gazer wrote that up some years ago, which is trying to describe the motivation for, um, for this. Excellent. And when you say taking back, it just... Um, using, as he says, um, amateur efforts to um, uh, motivate um, um, 
technology in the hands. It, you know, we all have this technology in our hands now, and uh, so in a sense, it's a um, way to actually put it into practice and and inspire and motivate um, more groups like you guys uh, to just get in the business in a sense, push the envelope. Um, who is this for? The is the next question. Who is the the far the uh, far horizon balloon? Who who is it being built for? When when which is kind of it's a follow-up to that question. So the the why is what what do you hope to get out of it? The who is who participates? And I think uh, we already hear a little bit that it's yeah. about students, it's about enthusiasts. Mm -hmm. um, are there other groups? Um, there's schools as well. I mean, this is kind of the student, but uh, as an institution, schools, uh, we've, in the last um, year, uh, we want, we realize a larger community, the people involved in this thing, is just better for us as well, where we get more people uh, with more skills and experience coming to us. So, for example, we started three, or we, you say, two high school clubs in the last couple of years. And we're helping the launch tomorrow is actually for Illinois Institute of Technology, IIT, started a balloon club and they approached us knowing that we have the experience. So we're flying their first payload. Um, so, you know, in a sense spawning other groups. So, and that can be literally just about anybody. Uh, we just did, last month we did a flight with the Boy Scouts. We invited some troops, Boy Scouts to come out and um, experience the flight. And so that's just like another, um, in a sense, population of people that we're trying to reach out to. So in, in that sense, you're you're providing the platform mm -hmm. for them. They provide the payload. Well, basically, is that at the first step? But what we want to do is also get them familiar with this and realize how doable it is mm -hmm. on their own. So in a sense, hand holding until they're free to fly their own. Okay. And that's sort of the motivation. We couldn't. We don't have the staff or the support to be able to. Run all these programs, but typically we'll go out and facilitate their first flight, and then lend them technical support for follow-up flights and advice, and all we do So, and if you're asking for who, um, also the we find uh, our volunteer core is very similar to a maker group, for example. Um, uh, we have volunteer opportunities that really pull in people who are would be the same, very similar population. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I'm not sure if this is relevant or enough, but or, or not. But uh, one of the things I found, only having a little bit of experience with like major groups and stuff, is um, I think we have an, an oddly different population, but they're very um, sympathetic. So it's a lot of people that would kind of be put off a little bit, or like feel a little daunted by like a maker group, uh, like joining one or, or and. This is a little bit more of a easing into that mm -hmm. kind of, mm -hmm. if mm -hmm. that makes sense. So it's maybe it's a little bit more of a, um, how would you say, like acceptable or, you know, like a comforting uh, kind of introduction to that kind of world. Okay. So, you know what I mean? It's a yeah. program that's already running, it's not a program that's already yeah. formed, and we should look for expertise as opposed to them starting on a Right, that's right. Well, and I think that is an interesting uh, point. Um, different maker spaces or actor spaces work in different ways where um, some of them do very very group organized projects and some of them are very much here's the tools yeah. people come in and have their own projects and they maybe grab their buddy and work on something but it's it's a very different experience from joining an established project team and and finding a role to play within that okay absolutely And, and I would just like to echo um, the, the idea about expanding out to makers and maker spaces. Mm -hmm. This idea about that, um, I mean, I'm definitely fully in support of schools and, and school clubs and mm -hmm. students participating. Mm -hmm. I wish there had been something like that when I was in high school. <laughs> that would have been awesome. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and I think that that's absolutely important outreach. but. I, I think that there is uh, something very important about re-engaging with the enthusiast community mm -hmm. uh, and demonstrating to them that, like you said, that they can participate in, in space exploration and, mm -hmm. and that it's, it's within, getting started is within reach. 
Um, there might be some stuff that is currently outside of reach, but I think starting small and working up to it means that what is out of reach today is in reach tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, all these uh, these different groups of people, um, you know, we focus on our strengths. Uh, we have a, most of what you see out there, we call Cube Land, is our entire education department. We have a huge education department. So we already have the contacts with schools. We already have relationships <coughs> with teachers. And so that's a natural for us. Yeah. Um, and it's one of the reasons why you guys are interesting to me, because we're trying, we haven't really reached out to that group too much, uh, hacker spaces and makers and things like that. And, you know, for example, the more you can help us find Absolutely. the right connections with those people, that would be great for all involved. Right. So we talked a little bit uh, about that on the way here, just what other groups would be interested in as soon as these plans are up. We can say, hey, these are up. You've been talking about a half for a while. Go, you know, go do it. So. So taking notes so at this meeting you want to go down a gear until we hit a point where I can't take notes you're welcome to because okay. I'm, I'm just since we have online access I'm just dropping them straight in the website okay. <laughs> yeah. Sounds good. projects there's a projects link in the upper left hand corner of the ODE page oh, okay. and if you click that and scroll down about three quarters of the way down the page should be the Shepherd project actually I think that's only projects you're signed up to oh, that's I see is Shepherd in there yeah okay cool. hey by the way uh, I might be uh, yeah that's no, all right going backwards a little bit but could you explain mock 30 to me Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. I've never. I'm I've always sorry. I, 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 that would have been. I knew it, and then every once in a while, I'm like, wait, maybe I don't understand what. Sure, is. sure. Um, so we are a, an, a we are an established 501c3 public charity, mm -hmm. whose mission is to hasten the advancement of humanity into a spacefaring civilization, mm -hmm. and there are three core pillars that really support that in our mission, as far as we're concerned. Um, the first is sustainable leadership, um, and this is about pacing ourselves. This is about recognizing that to go to the the gap between where we are and becoming a spacefaring civilization is a marathon, not a sprint. Yep. And that as as a lot of us have ref who are in the leadership of Mach 30 have reflected on space programs of the past, mm -hmm. there's been a lot of sprinting. Um, with the biggest version of that being Apollo. Yep. 
there's a it's the fundamental billions of dollars. But what, well, <laughs> yeah. but the other thing is it's unsustainable. Yeah. yeah. It, Apollo was a a wonderful feat of engineering, but did not move the ball down the field very far in terms of spacefaring, mm -hmm. uh, because it was not sustainable. If it yeah. had been sustainable, we would have our lunar colonies by, by now, <laughs> yeah. and we'd be pushing to Mars and and have and putting flags on Mars. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, if you want to really change things, it has to be in a sustainable pace, and you have to make decisions that are the long game decisions. So that's the first pillar. The next pillar is open design or open source hardware. Mm -hmm. The idea that if you want to change the game in terms of engineering development time, one of the big wins that has been in the last 20 years or so uh, has been the open sourcing of things. Uh, look at the power of Wikipedia, look at the power of open source software, to take excess human cycles, for lack of a better way to put it, and give them an outlet that moves the ball down the field on the things that people are passionate about. And there are plenty of people that are passionate about space. And to gather their attention uh, and give them a rally point and a place to spend their spare cycles. Um, and I think Jeremy is a lovely example of this, having contacted us in February and saying, I would like to, I would like to help. What you know? What is there to do? And uh, the, the value he's been able to add to the organization, helping manage the uh, Shepard project, and to be um, to have spare human cycles to spend on that project, has been immeasurable. And every time we get another person who is interested like that and give them a project that scratches their itch as much as it scratches ours, the the ball moves down the field, and then everyone can build upon those successes. Um, it's amazing how much. For example, of the Wright Brothers airplane is actually developed from open designs, mm -hmm. from things that were published over the previous century, mm -hmm. and were how that's how in four years a pair of bicycle mechanics could go from knowing very little about aircraft to flying the first heavier than air vehicle yeah. control. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah, the, yeah. The, you know, to define what it is to be an airplane, uh, and it's because they built on a hundred years of research that was openly published for them to do that. Mm -hmm. um, and so we want to see the same thing happen in spaceflight because we're we're in a rut. Yeah, we find that uh, the reinventing the wheel, um, the effort gone into things that have already been done is is just ridiculous in this field. You know? Yeah. Um, Mark. Hey. Um, okay, Hi. This is oh. Jay. Yes. Hi, I'm Jay Hi. Simmons from Hi. Mark Third. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Jeremy, all right? Jeremy. Nice to meet you. Is it the J? J, just J. a letter. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I accidentally <laughs> keep calling him Nate or something like J A Y, and I realize it's not his name. Uh, welcome. So that's the another yeah. piece is that um, to start getting these things out in the open, so that we can build more quickly. Yeah. And that's the thing is that it accelerates the pace of development, both in terms of uh, getting to, to leverage volunteer hours, but also in terms of. Uh, not reinventing the wheel. Uh, the other thing we often, the other example we often give in open design is, if you're going to, if you were going to start a rocket company today that was meant to deliver payloads to space, almost certainly the very first thing you would do is hire a bunch of engineers to develop a rocket engine. That's because when you start from, there is nowhere to go to buy a 747 of spaceflight. Uh, so if you want to, uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. But if you want to be the FedEx of space, and that's what Elon Musk wants to be, is the FedEx of space. Um, the very first thing he had to do was drop a billion dollars on rocket engineering. That's ridiculous. Even though those problems were pretty much solved yeah. decades ago. So uh, open design, yeah. open source hardware yeah. also moves yeah. that ball down the field. Not definitely. Um, I mean, when, as an example, when you're trying to design a cut-down system, um, Search long and hard trying to find any. Sure, this is something that many, many people yeah. have faced and they've done and they've worked out successful solutions, but you just cannot find yeah. complete uh, schematics and, and lists of and parts. And that's where open source things. hardware comes in. Yeah, absolutely. So creating an environment yeah. where that is natural. It's actually going to be one of the bigger hurdles for us culturally is that the aerospace industry is a very reserved industry, I think, because yeah. it's so affiliated with things related to the military. Yeah, sure. Yeah. And it's understandable. A lot of the things they do are state secrets. Mm -hmm. And so they the culture becomes, we don't talk about that. Right. <laughs> <laughs> he, he was, you know, you're one of your main rallying cries at the uh, CubeSat. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Keeps that thing was that you know you were talking about ITAR um, and oh yeah, yeah. into it and stuff and and it's like yeah it's amazing when 
Yeah, there are, there are many, many quite benign technologies that are fall under. Uh, <laughs> oh, yeah. For it's the ITAR nut will be the harder nut to crack than the rocket yeah. engineering wheel, honestly. Yeah. I, I say that all the time, it's true. In terms of open source hardware, yes. Yeah, for space flight applications, yeah, absolutely. It absolutely is. And then the. We were going over what Mach 30 asked does. Me to yeah. Ba yeah, briefly yeah, yeah. summarize Mach 30. And then the other piece of Mach 30 um, is uh, the other core foundation that the other pillar is uh, mature tech, is a reliance on mature technology. So one of the other things, if you look at people that have proposed solutions to some of the problems that we want to eventually tackle, uh, which include safe and sustained routine reliable access to space. I mean, that's the kicker right now. If you want to become a spacefaring civilization, the first thing you need is is a way to get to space right. when you want to, not when the weather will let you, and not when you can muster half a billion dollars. Yeah, I think the latter is right now. Yeah. Well, yeah. There, there, uh, yeah. If you go and look at what happens at the Cape, it's, it's, yeah. a, it's a strong True. mix of both, no, I, I, right? I, I, it, there, there's a huge, the pace is set by money, right. and the actual launch day is set by the environment and by the complexity of the machine that they're operating. Um, but if you want to be a spacefaring civilization, you have to get away from that conundrum. And the proposals that people have put out there very frequently involve, if we could just have this one piece of technology from Buck Rogers, we'd be good. Right, <laughs> right. Uh-huh, okay, that's great. And some of that stuff is within reach someday. The problem is when you're not building on top of, when it's not an evolutionary step and it's mm -hmm. a revolutionary step, mm -hmm. it's perpetually 15 years in the future. Yeah. Um, hypersonics have been 15 years in the future since I was a kid in grade school. Right. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, that was a while ago. Um, so uh, you can't bet the farm on those kind of technologies, not because they aren't the things we eventually want to get to, but because they perpetually stay 15 years out of reach. And so the other major pillar here is to say, when we develop systems, when we develop projects, we start from a place of maturity and evolve capabilities rather than saying, well, let's take the Hail Mary pass and let's somehow miraculously make hypersonics work. Um, it's just too expensive and doesn't pay off in the kind of time frame we want to pay off in. Um, and so that affects everything from the fact that our projects tend to be kites. Our initial projects tend to be what we refer to as kites, in quotes. And the idea there is they're very, very low cost, very, very simple uh, requirements in terms of low barrier to entry, so that the first time you do a thing, even if you completely screw it up, the lessons learned were totally worth the two or $300 you spent on it. Sure. Whereas if you spent two or $3,000 when you're a small startup like us, that becomes noticeable money if it doesn't pay off. But at two or three hundred dollars, even if what we get out of it is we learned how we learned important lessons about what to do and what not to do, we we got our money's worth. If on top of that it was successful, that's bonus. Yeah, I mentioned that uh, you guys started this hey, right. what, about six years ago, kind of uh, as a stepping stone to you know, keep set. Uh, uh, here we are, right. six years yeah, later. Yeah, but yeah, yeah, we're yeah, yeah. we're uh, pretty good at doing this. Well, part of the part of the reason for our delay getting into CubeSats, though, is because uh, there was so much that we can do with the learning yeah. that we fit it into our programs yeah, here, exactly. so, yeah. so yeah. successfully. So we yeah. kind of uh, yeah, it's not an excuse. Our progress it's more has like been a, a victim of our success. Yeah, yeah, yeah okay. absolutely. Well, and I think that that's the uh, uh, so okay. I think those are right. welcome surprises um, from things that we yeah, call so, kites. Uh, is when not only did you manage to learn lessons for low cost, but you actually yeah. developed a, cap a yeah. very capable system for orders of magnitude less money than you would ever be able to do the next level of system. Uh, for, that's right, for the next level of system and uh, for at least an order of magnitude less development time and uh, effort. Uh, uh, yeah. We could never do a CubeSat program uh, from start to finish um, with so, uh, middle school uh, kids within a week. No. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Not even 10 minutes. Yeah, we can watch them and have them analyze data. Yeah, yeah. 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 At, at, at some level. I mean, right. yeah, at some level. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. No, I sure. no point. It's just like they're, they're walking away as you know aerospace engineers, right? Not right. Yeah. And and in fact, we're actually developing the other product. And I'm going to steer us back towards this yeah, stuff in a minute, but I think this is uh, yeah, this Mark missed some of the early stuff. It's another project that we're working on right now in parallel with this project. Uh, with working with you guys to get this project documented and shared with some That's maker wonderful. spaces yeah. Uh, yeah, that are interested in building copies of this. Yeah. Uh, is uh, another project we're doing is a test stand for SD's class motor, rocket motors. Yeah. 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 
the idea being that um, the, the value of this is practicing open hardware mm -hmm. work, but also giving you a platform to teach people how to do te rocket testing, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. how to test motors safely and right. accurately. Because those motors are all manufactured. We're talking about mm -hmm. just the cardboard little yeah, manufactured yeah. motors are mm -hmm. the things you can test with this test stand. Well, the good news is they're very reliable. Mm -hmm. they, they have a very specific performance mm -hmm. characteristic yeah. about mm -hmm. them. So when you okay. get the answers and you analyze right. your data from the test, if there's a discrepancy, so, more often than not, it's about you need to learn how to yeah. do things better or there's an error in the test stand. Okay. It's so unlikely so if you get a gross behavior difference that it was a motor unless it was one out of a thousand or whatever. Right? And so it's a great it's educational tool. In a sense. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, it's a great uh, educational tool for uh, us as engineers and again, another thing where you can take it to middle, our hope right. is you can take this to middle school students right. and be like, this is something that real rocket sure. engineers do, is they have to test the performance of motors. And Ray, so... Remind me tomorrow to introduce you to a few of the people that are at the IIT, um, the IIT team, because they are literally oh. aerospace engineers that are, they have, they've done this test, so they could probably... Absolutely. Or, or Great. And stuff. Excellent. Absolutely. I'll start to great. stick one of them in your car. That'd be great. That'd be cool. Peter might be good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah they, 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 that's, that's a, a neat and accessible kind of thing, and uh, you can show them many impressive videos of uh, full-scale little commercial rocket engines. Yeah. Or little, little engines. smoke and flame, man, goes a long way <laughs> to get people yeah. excited. Yeah. Yes, indeed. Cannot tell you, even little ones get people oh, yeah. excited. And then there's no reason that you can't scale that up. Right. There's a number of baby steps to mm -hmm. take in, in terms of both, well, how many measurements are you right. taking, what are you sampling, uh, and in terms of scale of the motor, there's a whole series of upgraded motors in high performance rocketry that you can still get what are essentially commercial motors mm -hmm. before you have to start worrying about testing something that is unknown. Right, right. And by the time you've worked out the capability on testing that wide variety of things that are known, you get into that place where you start testing something unknown and you feel a lot better sure, about it sure, in terms sure, of sure. confidence that you're going to get it right. Yeah, sanity checks. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. So yeah. So that's the other kind of thing we're working on right now, cool. and why this plays yeah. such a why this plays right into the stuff yeah. we're doing too. This is a great opportunity, I think, yeah. for everyone. It's really a nice yeah. synergy. Yeah. So um, I was going to say, you know, uh, it's up to you how mm -hmm. we're planning a new um, small conference room, new degree. Uh, any amount of time you want to do that, I'm going to yeah, probably yeah. for that. I'm probably going to pull out the trackers and uh, and because that's. More of your expertise, yeah, yeah, yeah. and no, uh, got, have them go through that. I've got my, okay. my, oh, essentially my day pulled aside. Yeah, cool. Um, so, as much as you want to. Yeah, yeah. This, uh, this I do 